Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to everyone. I am Mary Crawford. I'm interim COO of the YWCA of the City of New York. Our organization is one of the nation's oldest nonprofits committed to the personal and social development of women, their families, and their communities. Our association currently serves 1,200 children and young women in New York City. We provide leadership and advocacy training for young women through our Girls Initiatives program and youth development through our Out of School Time program for elementary and middle school children in culturally diverse communities across New York City. Stand Against Racism takes place annually in April, and it is a signature campaign of our mother organization, YWCA of the USA. And it is intended to raise the awareness about the negative impact of institutional and structural racism in our communities and to build community along with those who work for racial justice. This campaign is part of our larger national strategy to fulfill our nation, our excuse me, our mission of eliminating racism. We are delighted to be partnering with Women Creating Change today. WCC does amazing work to spark the advocate inside of us to create the change we want to see in our communities and our nation. Today's headlines are full of threats to democracy. And let's be clear, threats to democracy are threats to gender and racial justice. State legislatures across the country have passed laws limiting access to voting and the rise of totalitarian leaders has now led to war in Europe. Lincoln's words ring in our ears, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Protecting our democratic rights seems more urgent today than ever. Thank you for joining us in this important conversation today. Thank you, Mary. Um, and again, we're really excited to be co-sponsoring this um, with you today. I already said, and I'm just gonna go back one about me. I am Denisha. I am a consultant facilitator and coach who runs for Impact Consulting. It's a social impact firm um, that is really focused on repairing, building and positioning nonprofits for impact and growth. I am a lifelong Bronx fight first generation American who recognizes that um, I grew up with an immense amount of privilege, um, having a family who come to this country and benefited from the labor, um, the uh, contributions and um, the experience that so many African-Americans have had um, in this country, the oppression and so, um, my family immigrated to this country, and while we have not been um, uh, exempt from racism, we recognize that our history with it here in America is a lot shorter, and we have a lot um, to be grateful for and a responsibility now to give back and to make sure that we are working to uplift all people um, and to break oppressive systems and cycles that exclude many, many, many people who look like um, me. And so I am focused on justice, liberation, um, and really want us all, um, all people to do better. And so that's who I am. And I am joined today, as I mentioned, by three amazing, amazing people who will be sharing with you um, during our panel discussion. They are Cordera Coles. Um, and I'm going to just read Cordera's bio. Uh, right up front. And so Cordera Coles is a Penn State and John Jay alum, alumni with a BS in criminal justice and an MPA in public policy. Her undergrad work as a domestic violence advocate at Blair County Courthouse and a youth counselor at a child welfare agency fueled her passion for policy, politics, and a desire to be a catalyst for change. Cordera has served as a public po policy, as a policy advocacy fellow at the Legal Action Center working on policy that intersect health and criminal justice. She has worked on winning town council grassroots campaigns for a town first Latina council member as the millennial Gen X outreach coordinator, engaging new young voters. Cordera is the president and a board member of the New Jersey Abortion Access Fund and has also served as, Ignite's, as Ignite National's New York Region Fellow. 
where she worked with a large number of young women to organize and engage them to become politically active leaders in their community. She now serves as, as GGE's Deputy Director of Policy, continuing her work with young girls of color, but this time with the ability to influence legislative and budget policy and participate in government relations. As I said, powerhouse who we are lucky to have could do a ray, uh, shake um, uh, wave for us. I was gonna say raise your hand, but um, we go have you raise your voice in a second. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are also joined by Kaya Jones, who is joining us from Philadelphia. During the days, uh, during the day, Kaya works as an executive at Brunswick Group, advising major corporations and nonprofits on business and crisis management decisions. However, 24 seven, she is dedicated to advancing diversity, equity and inclusion for women and minorities in the community and across the country. She obtained a bachelor's of arts degree in political science and journalism and from Temple University in May, 2020. At Temple, she was a Dean's List Scholar, a member of the National Honor Society of Leadership and Success and served as vice president of external affairs of Temple University student government. Kaya formerly served as Ignite's Philadelphia Fellow. Kaya, um, give a wave and welcome. We are excited to hear from you. And last but certainly not least, we are also going to be joined by Reginald Bell. Reginald Bell says, my name is Reginald Bell and I am campaign and program fellows at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. I sit on the justice reform team, the fair court team, and the media and tech team. My priority, vision, my priority is justice reform. I am currently co-leading the Vote for Justice campaign under the Vision for Justice platform. I share my story in a short form in a short film of being directly impacted by the criminal legal system and the challenges I face upon re-entry, with messaging calling on governors to reinstate voting rights to the formerly incarcerated. And so also joined by Reginald. And so today the four of us are going to um, be in dialogue and hope that you all really um, are able to take something from this conversation that resonates with you, um, but also something that you're willing to share with someone else. The more we talk about this, the more we are in dialogue about the fact that while we have made progress, racism is alive and well and continues um, to have a serious impact on our ability to create an equitable future for all people, um, the better we'll be. And so thank you for being here today with us. Today, we are gonna discuss what is civics and civic engagement? Why does it matter? Who gets excluded? And hear and learn from our panelists. Before we hear from them, just to level set so that we are all defining this in the same way, we wanna share with you uh, a definition that we use at WCC around civics and civic engagement. So. What we like to say are, is that civics are both rights and responsibilities. As members of a community, you have certain civic rights. All the promises that society has made you as made to you as a member of a specific community. In addition to those rights, we have civic duties, right? Things that we should do, small and big, to really participate in creating and maintaining the type of communities that we want to live in. Like it is not someone else's job. It is all of our jobs to collectively um, participate in creating and being a part of the type of community that we want to live in. And so there are rights and duties. And what we say is that civic engagement are those behaviors, attitudes, and actions that are connected to your participation in the community. Um, that is meant to have an impact on accountability, wellness, and justice. And so again, there are civic rights, the things that you are guaranteed just by being here, right? Like the right to a fair trial, um, uh, the right to have your voices heard by your representatives. Like you just have civic rights. And then there are civic duties, your responsibility as a member of society, um, and ultimately the goal is democracy. As uh, Mary said, our democracy, I mean, this is not new, but um, it has been amplified more recently is under severe threat, right? Like the direct threat to democracy is now mainstream. 
Um, and the things that the quiet parts that people used to say behind closed doors are being said out loud, being shouted proud. Um, and not only are people talking about it, but they're doing things to undermine democracy. And so we, if we want to live in a country that cares for everyone's basic needs, um, that communities have power um, and the tools and the skills they need to participate in collective decision making to hold the people who represent them accountable and to remove them and replace them when they are not representing their interests, then all of us have a responsibility to find a way to participate. And one of the things I like to say is like, we can't boil the ocean, right? Like if we think of the million things that are going on um, in our country right now that present, pre present a threat to us and our families and our loved ones and our communities, um, but also a threat to our democracy, like we, we have to figure out the thing that we are most passionate about and that we really feel like we um, wanna participate in changing. And so, um, we really know that um, the other reason why this is so important is because this is not new, particularly when we connect it to racism, whether we are talking about redlining, like, like racism has been legislated into the, the fabric of our country. And so whether we're talking about, you know, things like redlining, things like um, uh, uh, policies that are around zoning and what gets built where, when we talk about criminal justice and Reginald is gonna talk about that a little later or drug policy. So many of the laws that have been on the books are ones that are steeped in racist um, thinking and beliefs um, and, and the desire of one group to oppress another group. And we know that to be true. And the other thing we know to be true is just cause you have a right today, don't mean you gonna have that right tomorrow, right? Like the fight to, for, for our rights it's not something that ends when a law gets passed. And in fact, just because some people have rights don't mean everybody got rights. And we say voting rights is a really good example of what we mean, because if we think about the trajectory and the history of voting in the United States, we know that from the beginning, it never included everyone. And there has been um, a, a, a succession of legislation you know, we think about when when um, uh, voting rights have been passed over the years, like first it was all men and not all men, white men who were landowning um, individuals. And so then women got the right to vote, but not really all women. Um, and then people of color got the right to vote through the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but not really because the voting suppression tactics that have been on the books and that continue now never stopped. And so while people quote unquote have the right to vote, we recognize that that does not mean that people have access to vote. And there are many people who are invested in continuing to exclude people from the voting process. And not just some people, black people, you know, indigenous people, Latino people of color, um, women, um, and so it is really important for us to think about what are the issues that when it comes to policy and the way they impact us, where we're not there yet, right? Where is racism legislated and how are we doing something about it um, as individuals and then collective groups to really move the needle um, so that we continue to see progress and not just laws passed and put on the books, but true access for all. Um, all people. And so I say that, and then we think, well, how can I make a change? What are some of the things that I could do that would make change? And here are a list of civic actions that people take all the time related to issues they care about, whether it is signing a petition or organizing, um, learning something and teaching someone else, being a part of a board, um, running for office, participating in the participatory budgeting process, volunteering, all of these things are civic actions that really help um, us to grow the collective power of communities to be able to fill the gaps that frankly, public policy and racism have allowed to be perpetuated um, throughout our country's history. Are there any questions? Okay, so why does it matter? 
Because what we know is that if we don't do it, who will? Um, we cannot expect the people who have um, perpetuated oppression, perpetuated exclusion, or who benefit from Black people being excluded from the process, from women being excluded from being at decision-making tables to now turn around and provide us um, with opportunities for equity and inclusion. Um, that has to be demanded. Um, that has to be um, something that we work on. And again, we find the issue that we connect to and that resonates with us and that we use that to really be the fuel for how we get engaged and why we participate. Um, again, many people benefit from keeping other people excluded, whether we're talking about people who have been formerly incarcerated, um, you just go down the list. The more ways um, that we can exclude specific groups of people, the more opportunities, those who are currently in power, who seek power, who benefit from the ca a capitalist system that um, creates, uh, just continues to perpetuate the inequities when it comes to wealth, income, the ability for people to live a good quality life, to now all of a sudden give that up, to just give it up because it's the right thing to do. It's not gonna happen. And so we really implore people to think about what can you do? How can you raise your voice? Where do you have influence? Even if it's just with a neighbor to begin to have this conversation on a regular basis if you're not. So that's how we get and jumped into this. As I said, I have introduced our amazing panel. Um, and at this time, I wanna just invite them to come off of mute um, and to share. We have some questions. I'm gonna throw them out. Um, you can feel free to answer them in um, any order. Any one of you can start. Um, but to get us started and just to little, understand a little bit about your journey now that we've heard um, a little bit about your background, our first question is, how do you first learn about civics and political, en political engagement. And what's your first memory of like consciously doing something that was related to civics? And like you knew you were doing this because it was about changing something or doing something. Um, anyone can get us started. I can jump in. Thank you, Denisha, for that intro and opening. Sorry, the sirens always decide to do this whenever I'm <laughs> wanted to speak. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> Thinking back to a specific time, I can think of one time when I made like the first conscious decision ever to be a change maker of some sort. It was in the third grade um, and we were learning about the civil rights movement and slavery. And meanwhile, back at home, I had a mother who was like very into history. We went to the library every weekend. We went to museums. We watched documentaries. Like she's always had conversations with me about the history of Black people in this country. So she was like my at home history teacher. So I had a like really strong foundation of the history of black people in this country before I learned about this in the third grade. So I realized that what I was learning in school about the civil rights movement and slavery was told in different ways than what I was being taught at home. So of course I questioned everything. I was definitely a, but why child? Um, <laughs> I just could not stand it at all. Um, and, but my teacher would always like dismiss me and say, well, that's just the way things were. It was the law um, as to say, like, it was just a normal way of life for black people to be um, discriminated against and dealing with racism. So, but at that time in the third grade, I wanted to be a professional Broadway dancer. So one day in class, I said out loud, well, I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I will change or create law so that this never happens again. And I always share the story because I that's like the clearest memory I have of like that pivotal moment where I was just like, all right, so I've been learning all of these things at home. It's being told differently in school. And, I, and it sounds a little weird that y'all teaching this in this way, a white teacher teaching a class full of black students in an urban neighborhood in a school district that's poorly funded about civil rights and slavery in this way. And that kind of like, lit a light bulb in my head and then from there it was history I mean you read the background so everything I've done after that has been to address all the conditions that folks are dealing with in this country thank you for sharing that story and you know what if that is actually so powerful now particularly in the context of where we are as a country and 
I mean, it's raw flawed history. We know they've been teaching flawed history forever when it comes to the history of Black people in this country, but now they're not even going to teach it. Now they're like putting laws on the books where like, we don't even want to talk about it. We don't want white, white children to feel uncomfortable. And so um, this is a real powerful story because in that, look at third grade galvanized you um, to, to be the change maker that you are today. So thank you for that. Reginald, Kaya, who's up next? Yes, I can go. Yep. Um, so similar to Quadira, I had a pretty strong foundation when it came to civic engagement. My grandmother was a city councilwoman in our small town um, for three consecutive terms. So I was used to like going to town hall meetings and seeing her be the woman in charge. Um, and that always empowered me to know like I could be in a similar position to her or like the the possibilities are limit the possibilities are limitless when it comes to that um but for me personally my first like interaction with civic engagement was when I went off to college um and I'm originally from Pittsburgh PA but I went to Temple which is in Philadelphia um and um, for those of you who don't know, Philadelphia is one of the largest, um, most populated when it comes to um, African American people and one of the poorest cities in the United States. Um, and where I went to school, Temple University is located right in the center of North Philadelphia. Um, so really one of the poorest locations in Philly um, with like high volumes of homelessness and um, hard hits to just like the opioid epidemic and other other um, sh things that have happened throughout the African American community. Um, so when I was going to vote for the first time, it was 2016, so a really interesting election. And I, but I was super excited to put my um, my vote out there and really advocate for what I believed in. And what I was confronted with when I went to my polling place was one, I had to walk like 30 minutes um, to get there. And then when I finally got there, I spent almost two, three hours just waiting in line to finally place my vote. And I saw people leave the line. I saw, um, I saw like people trying to ask people like, hey, can I get in front of you? I have to go to work or I'm only here for my lunch. Like I really need to put in my vote. This is the only time that I can. And I was just like, there's something wrong with this. Like people are not able to vote. There's a lack of access. There's a lack of equity when it comes to voting. And just for me being on a college campus, I was like, for college students, young people who are interested in voting, why isn't there something more accessible? So I started doing more research on this and I found out that the University of Pennsylvania and Ivy League school located um, more so in like the a nicer part of Philadelphia, they had a voting poll right on campus where students could just come to the center of campus, have a quick accessible way of voting. Um, so that immediately infuriated me, especially knowing that most of the population that goes to UPenn, they're not um, they're not from that community. You know, they're typically coming from different areas, a lot of whiter, um, more privileged communities. So it, it made me very upset because I felt like, and this polling place, there wasn't even access for community members to come there. Um, so even if it was like something that was closer for a person that lived a block away, they did not have access to that polling location. So that infuriated me. And that's when I began I began advocating for um, polling places on our campus and really made that a whole initiative of like work because I wanted to see that done. And ultimately now there is one, but it took years and petitions and agreements from the city and other officials and just getting people to listen to us and say, you know, there's a real problem here when it comes to access. So that was my first interaction when it comes to civic engagement. Thank you, Kaya. Um, another powerful story um, and a true demonstration of how like everyone can do something. I'm sure when you started at the beginning and there were many, many discouraging moments um, in trying to get more access on your campus, um, but thank you for doing the work that you did because small victories um, are still victories nonetheless. So thank you. Reginald, you are up, my brother. Thanks a lot. So, um, 
um, I had a unique experience of growing up in um, the Southeast section of Washington, DC, directly across the street from the Frederick Douglass home. So my early experiences were, you know, being very like entrenched in um, black history, what it is to be a black boy in the communities that I was in. Um, but just like Havira, it was kind of disheartening and kind of confusing because when I went to school, the lessons were totally different. Um, the values that were being instilled in me about who I was as a black boy were very different. Um, I think my first experience with uh, civic engagement was actually doing a fundraiser for school around, a, around, a, around about, I don't know, between the second and fourth grade. And uh, what we did was we voted a class president. Um, we had a, a little commission. And um, there were those of us that were chosen to actually go door to door to raise funds because what we we're trying to do was get art supplies um, for school for us to be able to you know, do um, artistic things with our time while we're in school. Um, and just going to door, having that experience of going to door to door and actually having to sell people or convince people of why they needed to donate and support us in our efforts to um, purchase our supplies uh, for school was a very, it was a very unique experience. It was very nervous and um, exciting and built with fear because you're going to total strangers and, you know, not knowing how to, um, how to speak to them about what it is or give the message to them that you wanted to give to them, that they would be, they, that they would be receptive of that message and um, be able to donate. So that's, that's pretty much my first experience with um, civic engagement in the community. Thank you, thank you. And actually, we're gonna stay with you, Reginald, for our next question um, up. We're gonna uh, think about a little bit around like in the context of voting rights, um, I'd like to a little understand a little bit about your work. Um, and if you could tell us in the context of voting rights and being suppressed across the country, why is voting import an important part of civic engagement? like especially at this moment in time um, and what should people do related to voting and cast after they cast their ballot? And so tell us a little bit about your work and then um, answer that question and we'll move on. Well, voting, if you, if you look at civil, like civics period, whether it be duties, responsibilities or what have you, voting is the common thread that, that binds all of these activities together. Without voting, you undermine all the other abilities that a citizen should have to be able to participate in civic engagement. Um, there's over, the United States has over 6 million people incarcerated who have been uh, restricted for voting rights. If you compile that number, 6 million votes is a lot of power and a lot of influence in a lot of communities across the country. But when you strip these voting rights from these individuals, um, it, it, it's very systematic, it's very purposeful, and it affects so many different areas. Um, there's just not one answer to this, and there's just not one area that it affects. Um, the inability to be able to vote also you know, hinders your um, ability to socialize, be a part of your community, um, be engaged because you feel like you're cast out. You can pay taxes, you can go on jury duty, you can have a family, you can be in the community, but you can't vote and have a say in how your community is treated and, re and represented. Um, the work that I do with the um, campaign, uh, with the vote, vote for Justice campaign is sharing my story and how I was directly impacted and uh, um, the struggles that I faced upon reentry and the things that were denied, being denied me. Um, it's a call to action to encourage people to reach out to their governors, to reenfranchise um, convicted felons, to give them back their voting right, to educate the public on what they can do to be engaged, um, how they can go about this engagement, and what are some of the things that they can do to be supportive and bringing back that power or tapping into that power of the potential 6 million votes of people who are either incarcerated or under some type of surveillance by the government and denied this, this right and this, this basic right and opportunity to be able to vote and, um, and affect the change in their communities. Thank you, Reginald. And so I'm going to ask you this question and then we're going to toss to Kadira and, and I'd like you to also respond to this question um, and then I'll share another question. What about for the people who say, my vote don't matter? Like, I vote, they still don't do whatever they want to do. My vote does not matter. Um, 
what do people need to do after voting? Well, it's more than just a four-year thing. That's first of all. Um, people need to be concerned with voting for DAs, sheriffs, um, city council members. And the thing about a system, when you have a system that you're trying to dismantle, you have to have a systematic approach. It's not that as soon as you cast your ballot, things all of a sudden change. It's about you taking an onus on yourself to do the things that you need to do to encourage and ensure that future generations also continue to fight. This is not a fight that's gonna be won within a four year span, a two year span, a 10 year span. This is gonna be an ongoing fight. And in order to, to, to gain the progress that we need to gain, we have to start somewhere. And if, even if those are small steps, those steps count. And I think people are often discouraged because we live in a society now where everything is just microwavable. Mm -hmm. It's just so many um, instantaneous reactions to everything. As soon as you hear something, people have opinions. As soon as anything happens, like everybody just go off the um, deep end about it. No one actually does background to understand why this is happening, what caused this individual to do what they did. And when you break down the system and you look at the effects of the system, you'll have a better understanding of why your vote may not count. Your vote isn't counting because you believe that you're supposed to just support, support a, demo, a Democratic representative or Republican representative instead of supporting the representative that is going to meet your needs and the needs of your community. And when people look at it through that lens, it gives them a better understanding that you don't have to be blindly loyal to a particular party in order to have your needs met. You need to do the research. You need to be well versed in what your community needs. And you need to support the individuals that are willing to see these needs of your communities met. And it may not happen instantly, but through your through your voting, your continuous voting, and your continuous questioning, because the thing about voting power is you can always hold these elected officials accountable Absolutely. for what they are doing and what they're not doing. So when you pose the, um, the potential threat that this power, that all these votes and all this support is going to be taken away from you, if you don't live up to the promises that you promised throughout your campaign, then we'll remove this from you and give this power to an individual who's going to represent us in the, in the light that we choose to be represented. There are some questions. So tell us a little bit about your work and, um, you know, how can civic engagement movement building um, advance racial justice and other issues that the Stand Against uh, Racism campaign is also highlighting in education and healthcare? And then, like, if people vote, what should they do after voting? Like, why, why is it important to continue? after voting and not just end with voting. And this is for me, right? Yes. Okay, so a little bit about the work I do. So I currently serve as Girls for Gender Equity's um, Deputy Director of Policy. And basically what I do is I lead the, sh um, the policy and budget advocacy strategy in the organization. But I also do work hand in hand with the young people that we have participating in our in-house programs. So what I do is I help prepare them um, with political education, with some like, you know, government 101 information and just general background so that they are prepared to go and testify at hearings, participate in participatory um, budget processes, and just like really hold their elected officials next to the fire when it comes to the things that impact them and all of the issues that we do legislative and budget advocacy on are issues that were directly identified by the young people that we have in our program. And I think from that experience, I think people have a general understanding that conditions in our lives are managed by politics. But what a lot of people, um, if you don't come from like this political world, you don't really realize that the biggest and most impactful issues are locally driven. Um, a lot of people see decision-making as top-down, which can be true in some instances, um, but issues like education, healthcare, policing, like that type of stuff is con concentrated on the local and the state level. And that's why we need to be pushing people to see beyond presidential um, elections, federal congressional elections, while those are important, um, engaging in school district or school board elections is more, I'm not even gonna say equally important, it's more important um, county elections, more important state congressional elections, 
way more important folks know like the governor and the mayor but there's some, like a whole nother side to government that really do the day-to-day -day decision making that folks need to be engaged in that process um and those are the people who determine like where the money goes if your school district gets x amount of dollars or if there's x amount of resources available for healthcare workers or if the budget of the local police department is going to go up or if it's going to go down <laughs> and these are places that we see the most systemic racism um so i think that we can continue to influence people to drive those elections and influence those elections because that's where like a lot of the heat like just like a pot of water water like the fires at the bottom that's where it starts to bubble up upward so um and then after you vote like reginald said it's like you're not going to cast your vote and then things are going to automatically change like things do take time the legislative process takes time, depending on what year it is, if it's an election year, um, important issues will take time. It's not right, but that's just the reality of politics in our world. But I do think what is really hard, and I think because there's an election coming up and I do a lot of political education, like all my social media with my peer groups, I still follow a lot of people from high school, college, like I keep a close knit community on my Instagram page and they know I'm the person who's always talking about issues, always talking about elections, um, talking about candidates and things like that. And a lot of people look to me like, OK, so when's the next election? Who is on the ballot? And then usually, you know, I'm very vocal about who I'm voting for and why I'm voting for them and then offering like, well, this candidate is, has this platform, this candidate has that platform. But when you have dishonest people running for office who uses people vulnerabilities and like our oppression in order to get themselves in office, and then when they get in office, they're singing a completely different tune that severs all trust that people have in our government. And then they're like, well, next election, I'm not voting because you said you used the things that were nearest and dearest to me that I really suffer with every single day in order to get my vote. You got my vote. And now you're completely going back on your word. And I'm struggling now because how can I have the audacity to tell someone to vote in this way when they have even proven me wrong? So I think a lot of advocates are also struggling like with after you vote, then what comes next? Because then what comes next is another election. And you can't keep telling people to vote for these people if they're not holding up their word, they're not being ethical and they're not being honest. So unless we have honest people running for office and really sticking to their word, it makes it harder on the advocates who want to bridge that gap between people power, the people in the community and to the voting polls. Like I'm, the, we are trying to be that bridge there, but it's, these folks are making it really hard for us. So yeah. I actually don't know what to tell people to do afterwards, but I think the most important thing is just continue to build power within your community, continue to politically politically educate them. Please do not tell people to rely on the news because we all know that that is biased reporting. Like do some deep, like some deep dive political education so that you are in tune with everything that's going on around you. And that's how you build strength and courage within your communities to mobilize in big moments and create big change. Thank you for that. You said so many powerful things that I just said. You know, I struggle with that as someone who offers, you know, at WCC, we offer these civic matter workshops and we talk a lot about um, how decisions are made locally in the community and why it's so important. And oftentimes, the same thing I struggle with. But if you say when someone's like, yeah, well, what about this? And you're like, you know what, you're right. But um, voting is such an act of resistance, right? Like, even if, um, uh, even if your candidate doesn't win, or your candidate wins and they're not like accountability is important but an act the act because so many people are working so hard to suppress your vote and to keep you from voting um as reginald talked about i think it's such an important act to resist and to say yeah no i'm still vote and what you said holding people next to the fire and, and... i uh, we're gonna run to you um we'd love for you to talk a little bit about your work um, and if you can tell us how the power, how you believe the power of civic engagement, um, what you believe about the power of civic engagement, and also um, what can we do to encourage those around us 
who may not, given all we just said, may not be engaged to get engaged. Um, and I think one of the things that Cordera said around like things take time, Reginald also said, things don't happen overnight, it takes time. And you shared in your story how it took time to get additional access and there's still not enough access. And so um, would love to hear more about your work. Um, and then again, can you talk a little bit about the power of civic engagement? Um, right, so members? thank you for that. And I really um, loved hearing the other panelists' response to this question and have a lot of synergies. Um, at Ignite, we're all about empowering young women to get more involved in politics. Um, and one of our main focuses is doing that locally because um, as Representative Blake Presley said, the people that are closest to the pain should be closest to the power. And we truly believe that. Um, and we, so I would say like the first step when it comes, we, we are looking at young women, um, women that are motivated and ready to start their career or start their life in politics, or if they're not thinking about that yet, how we can make that make sense and, and find a bridge of like politics is personal. It's not, um, it's not just like, it can be personal. In the past, we've seen that like people are advocating for things that they care about and it's been like non-minority people so maybe like taxes or inflation and things like that when we're still stuck at you know the basic needs part of like um human human rights and, and basic decency and respect and equality um so we're always saying like we need to find a way to make politics personal for people and I think one way of doing that is one, educating ourselves and researching, you know, what's going on in our community, what does our community need, and also terminology. I'm learning that like words matter and like saying things the right way, reproductive justice versus reproductive rights, like those are two different things, or just how you broke down civic engagement versus civic rights and civic responsibility. Like terminology matters and people are holding us to a standard to to say things it wasn't um someone didn't die they were murdered like these are the terminology is really important so I think that's the first step of like research and definition explaining then there's the active or like the um advocacy and engagement of like voting yes we're encouraging all people to vote because that makes a real impact. Um, donate, spread information in your community. But then I think where Ignite really wants people to take it a step farther is if you're not seeing the change in your community that you would like to see, or if you are seeing a lot of dishonest um, politicians like Kodira was speaking of, then you need to be that change and run for office um, or empower a friend, join a campaign of someone that you believe in and that you support that you wanna see be successful because we all know it takes a village. So I, I would say that's one way that we're really trying to get more people involved and interested. And then when you're the person that's in charge, you can make politics personal for you and for your community and feed the needs that they have, whether that be like, like politics is is so much more than what we're seeing it's the food that we eat um living in a food desert for like over four years that was very prominent to me like politics impacts that now with um adulting and trying to figure out that life i'm like oh okay politics is directly um impacted or the gas prices are directly impacted by politics, like the money that I'm spending on gas, this matters, um, or even like paying taxes and education and all that. So it, it's a lot. And I hope, and what I just try to do is connect with someone one-on-one -on -one and just say, you know, what do you need from, what do you need in your community? And then from there, there's probably something or some policy, some advocacy that can be done to get that accomplished. Um, so I think it's all about making that connection. I don't know. I said a lot, but oh, <laughs> very powerful. From Thank it. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, we didn't even need question prompts. Y'all are so on it, um, and hitting all of, um, the important information that we wanted to, to discuss today as we get ready to close. And before we take any questions, um, can you just share like 
for all three of you, what's your dream legislation? You are out there pounding the pavement, working hard, doing advocacy, thinking about policy. Um, if you could have a one wish of your dream legislation and get it passed, what would that be? Anyone can start. Voting rights for all. Yeah. We can reinstate voting rights for all, like all representation. That would be my dream scenario. Not necessarily because I lived it and I was directly impacted. Voting, in my experience, gives you a sense of confidence and awareness that other things just don't give you. Like people can share their stories, but to actually be able to do something about the situation, there's one thing to, I guess, go to um, people or try to tap into resources about what's going on, but to actually have an ability is very empowering and it's, it's courageous. Like it, it makes you feel courageous. Like it makes you feel like you're fighting or you're standing up, even if you're not physically, literally fighting. The fight is something like, it's just so amazing to just have that feeling. Like it's just indescribable. Like you have to actually experience it to really tap into the, the energy and, and the feelings that I'm expressing about having that, that power to choose how your community will be affected and to choose who represents you in these different offices. Thank you. Next, dream legislation. For me, it's so hard to pinpoint one. I know. Just, I, know. I, I, wanted, I want to save the whole world, but I know I can't <laughs> do that. <laughs> but what I've learned working in policy advocacy legislation, dealing with elected officials, what I've learned is that money speaks and money is the number one motivator. Money has so much power. So... Well, and I noticed that when I'm pushing for bills that have like symbolic wins or there's not a lot of money attached, there's like, it's so easy to get it passed because they want to say, I did this for you. I did this for this group, this community, but it really doesn't have any teeth. And those are the bills that elected officials are more like, okay, that's no sweat off our back. The optics are there. So we're going to do it. But when it comes to legislation that has a fiscal impact and requires a large, even a small amount of investment and folks who have historically been ignored, that's when they start to drag their feet and that's when they have a thousand excuses. So my dream legislation would be like, or how even like, it would just be like budget justice, like making sure that city and state budgets are equitable, um, I can identify one budget that is extremely bloated. And if you chip away at that, the police budget, if you chip away dollars at their budget, you can fully fund schools. Schools can have restorative justice programming. Schools can implement legislation like comprehensive sex ed or solutions, not suspensions in New York where they have enough money to hire the personnel in order to implement those bills. Um, we can fund after school programs so that young people have places to go instead of giving the NYPD money so that they can have youth programs. So again, it's like another layer of youth surveillance and just like building power within the police department while ignoring everything else. So if I had a dream budget policy, it would be to defund the police and reduce the over-reliance on policing to solve all of our issues like mental health crisis, domestic violence, education, public safety in schools, like all of these things can be solved in different alternative ways that does not involve policing, but um, it, it requires money and that's where folks get scared. So budget justice all the way. Thank you. Kaya, and then we have a question in the chat that we'll get try to get to before we close. Okay, I'll say um, free health care for all um, or accessible, affordable health care for all. Just from my personal experience, from my family's experience, like I, I've lived abroad also in, in Europe and seen the impact of like what free health care looks like and how much of a healthier lifestyle you live if you just have access to speaking to a doctor on a regular basis. 
Like, there were years where I had no primary doctor because it was just, like, too much of a hassle for my mom and um, the insurance didn't cover a lot of stuff that I needed done or she needed done. And it's just sad. Like, that's a basic need, a necessity, a human rights necessity that people need. Like, I, I don't understand it, all the profitability um, around the healthcare system. It just needs to chill out and it needs to be focused on people living help, happy, healthy lives. Um, because I think that's the start to a lot of, a lot of stuff. Thank you. And then we have, I wanted to build on what Kaya just said a little bit of how everything is so interconnected. So I live in Newark, New Jersey. I was born and raised in New Jersey. I moved to Newark, which is an environmental war zone. Like children who grow up here, grow up with the risk of lead poisoning of developing asthma. And so within my four to five years here, I've developed severe asthma and I had like a life threatening like asthma scare recently where I had to see a pulmonologist and I have pretty good insurance. I have a pretty good job. You know, I have an education. I have all of these things, but me living and me being a black woman living in a urban neighborhood or a town that is like um, a melting pot for like these sludge factories and it contributes to black and brown folks and poor folks' health. I, me thinking I have, you know, this is covered. I have health insurance. No, I'm slapped with like a couple G's medical bill and it's like shaking me to my core. Meanwhile, I'm involved in politics. I'm, I'm civically engaged. A lot of people think that their privilege makes them exempt from all the racist systems that we have in this world. And that goes to show that it doesn't. And it's like so heartbreaking that even when you do invest in money, in your own healthcare, just the cost of healthcare in general is a lot. And it's like, I developed asthma as a result of an environmental racist issue that I, you know, that no one deserves. So it's just like a never ending cycle. And unless folks you know, elected officials get with it and understand that the lives of people who are living in these areas are valuable Then every, I can imagine what a, someone who makes less than me, who have children, I can like only imagine what they have to go through with their children, having lead poison or catching asthma, like all of these things. And it's so heartbreaking. It's just like everything is interconnected and that's why it's important for folks to put people in office who understand the risks that people take when they're living in North, when they love areas like this, that has such a risk, rich, beautiful history. You want to stay in areas like this, but you also risk all of these other things. Thank you for that. And Kyle put in the chat and not only physical health, but mental health as well. So thank you for that. Um, we had a question around, uh, and we just have a couple of minutes. And so uh, if one of you can answer it, Kaya, you had mentioned some of what I think is related to this question earlier. Um, what are some things young people can do to become civically engaged? Um, great question, Blaine. Um, I mean, social media is a really big avenue for advocacy right now. And young people are already there. I feel like we often have to meet people where they're at. Um, especially with grass, grassroots organizing. So we need to go to social media. I think that's one big way and get, make it cool, make it fun, make it TikTok-y, I guess. It, whatever gets the message across that we're trying to get across, like that, that's what we need to do. Um, so I think social media is a great avenue for that. Again, also just like looking at young people, what are young people interested in? Student debt, um, that's a big policy that like a lot of young people in the inaccessibility to like higher education care about. Um, I know for myself personally, I care a lot about reproductive justice and women having access to like menstrual products as a young person um, and having a right to choose and things like that. So. I think, I think, you know, we really have to focus on what are the issues that young people are caring about now and then make those a platform area um, for, to get people engaged. Um, but also defer to my other panelists because I'm sure they have great stuff. In our last minute, anyone have anything to add to that? We have about another minute. All right. Well, if, oh, 
sorry mm-hmm. if not like if you're a black woman a black young woman like we care about our hair and one of the major policies is often like hair justice like that that if that's something that interests like young people in your community then make that a center stage of the platform and and there's so many ways that um young women can get engaged especially on when it comes to social media and things like that too on that topic specifically but I could go on forever. So I'm just As we all can, because you're passionate um, about these issues. And I will just say, um, uh, there are actions that you can do to get started right away. I want to just give a moment of, take a moment to express my deepest gratitude and appreciation for our panelists who shared such rich information with us. Um, uh, it is so powerful to hear these stories. Our lived experiences are so important and what we bring to the table. Um, is so important when we're having these conversations. And thank you for sharing so openly with us. Um, before we leave, and we want to thank our sponsors, WCC um, and the YWCA for creating space for us to be able to have this type of conversation. Before we uh, sign out, we are at time. We just want to share some now actions you can take if you're thinking about civic engagement and you're not really sure where to start and it just all feels so big. Um, we're going to share this information with you after in our follow-up email. There are tons of places where you can go to get involved and get engaged. Uh, Kaya mentioned social media. Starting there is a great place to find groups that are like-minded um, and uh, uh, will engage you in the topics that you care about. Find out who represents you. I mean, check. It changes regularly um, because holding them accountable is important. And if they are not representing your interests, Voting and replacing them is also important. And then make a civic commitment. Pick something um, on, a, on the slide to do anything that will get you moving. Um, and then just tips for getting started, start close to home. We know that local decisions are the decisions that impact everyone's daily life. Um, and so find local groups that are thinking about and advocating around issues that you care about. Do a little self-examination, ask yourself, what's important to you? What issues do you care about? What are your key values? What do you wanna see in your community? Answering those questions often help you be able to identify issues and spaces that you wanna be um, a part of when it comes to your civic journey. Find the candidates or causes that represent you. Put your rep's number in your phone, like on speed dial. Do not be afraid to call up um, and to share. Um, and make that easy for yourself by saving that information. And then again, amplify um, these messages. For someone in your life, you are a trusted messenger. Um, and it is really important to talk to the people to whom you have influence to share why civic engagement is so important, why doing something uh, to help improve an issue you care about helps you, helps your community, and why we cannot wait for anyone else to save us. Racism is real. It is not new, and the tactics that have been used historically to oppress people um, are being used now, and they're being amplified. And so we need daily acts of resistance if we are ever going to um, get closer to liberation, equity, and justice for all people. We thank you all for joining us today. We thank you for sharing two extra minutes of your time. Um, and again, we are ever so grateful to our panelists and to everyone who joined us here today. Let's keep the conversation going. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we wish you all peace. Um, we wish you all a good day. And we hope that you will come back to one of our future workshops um, and help us continue this conversation. Thank you all so very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>